Today, I want to take you on a journey of understanding just a little bit more about our universe and our place within it. In our universe, most galaxies experience a rags-to-riches story. A typical galaxy starts life very small, with as few as only tens of thousands of stars. These stars and the reservoir of gas left over from forming them are composed of just two elements, hydrogen and helium. Now, where, where possible, astronomers like to keep things simple. So anything other than these two elements we call metals. So this small galaxy is poor of metals. Now, the other important ingredient in a galaxy, as we shall see, is a mysterious outer halo of something invisible, which astronomers like to call dark matter. This dark matter is like a heavy, protective outer layer that keeps the outskirts of the galaxy spinning rapidly, like a figure skater with her arms in, and importantly, provides the necessary gravity for stars to form out of the gas. Now, it seems that all galaxies, including the small and very metal poor, have a halo of dark matter. But things are looking up for our small galaxy. Through careful saving and some clever investments, she starts to build up her riches. As her stars mature, the hydrogen and helium burn into heavier and heavier elements. And when the stars die in a supernova explosion, they spray these metals throughout the galaxy, enriching the gas which will form the next generation of more metal-rich stars. So, in doing so, the galaxy's riches increase progressively more and more. Now, at the same time, the galaxy eats a bit more too, feeding off of the gas and stars from nearby galaxies and accumulating a larger dark, dark matter halo, which keeps it spinning rapidly at the outskirts. So, as time proceeds, the galaxy ends up rich in metals and large. This model explains most galaxies in the universe quite well. Galaxies start off small and poor of metals, made of just hydrogen and helium, and over time they become large and metal-rich, like our Milky Way galaxy. The presence of metals in the Milky Way is one of the key reasons that we are here. Not a why reason, but a how reason. We need carbon for our bodies, we need oxygen to breathe, we need calcium for our bones, we need proper metals to build telescopes and discover these sorts of things. So, in general, it is only the large, advanced galaxies, which are metal-rich, that are able to harbour life like ours. But we think that there are other important methods for forming galaxies. Now, in astronomy, we have a two-pronged approach. Some of us do experiments with galaxies that we see, and others do experiments with simulated galaxies. The advantage of real galaxies is that we know they are real, and the advantage of simulated galaxies is that we are free to choose the conditions and to test our models much more easily than just with what we happen to find in the universe. When these two approaches meet, it means that we are progressing in our understanding of how the universe works. A nice example of this are the antenna galaxies behind me. Our images of these galaxies and our understanding of the physics show that these galaxies are colliding. Giant streams of stars and gas spray out behind them in their wake. Our simulations predict that new galaxies can actually form in the debris of these types of collisions. And indeed, we do see new baby galaxies being formed right at the top of this image in the end of that stream. This is how it works. When two large galaxies meet and are gravitationally attracted to each other, they get together and form a baby galaxy. The small new galaxy inherits some of the big galaxy's riches, so we say it is born with a silver spoon in its mouth. Now, the parent's fireworks are sufficient to create the stars for the new galaxy, so it doesn't need its own halo of dark matter to make stars like normal galaxies do. In fact, it's too small to capture any dark matter from the big galaxies, so we know it's only composed of stars and gas. Notice that it is rich in metals, it has lots of metals, even though it is only small, but it's not spinning rapidly because it doesn't have a halo of dark matter. 
Instead, it's spinning slowly at the edges like a figure skater with her arms out. Now, we know about millions of galaxies, but only dozens of these small, already rich ones. They are interesting because although they are small and new, they are already rich enough in metals to harbour life. And the way in which they spin slowly at the edges could change what we know about gravity. Now, although they are interesting, they are hard to find because they are faint and relatively rare, and they don't look much different from normal small galaxies. To discover that they are silver spoon galaxies, we have to ensure that they are both rich in metals and that they are spinning slowly at the edges due to there being no dark matter halo that would keep them spinning rapidly. It's important to pick up, tick off both of these criteria because there are other reasons that a small galaxy could become metal rich. Both of these measurements are difficult because of the faintness of the galaxy. For metals, it's not possible to measure all of the different metals that are in a galaxy. So instead, we have to estimate the total content by counting up some of the most commonly occurring ones. There are different ways to do this, and these different accounting methods give us different measures of richness. And for dark matter, well, dark matter is called dark because it's invisible. We can't detect it directly, so instead we have to detect its significance by measuring how fast the faint edges of the galaxy spin. Now, neither of these two measurements can be made just by taking photos of a galaxy. So instead, I have to use sophisticated telescopes that can measure the spectrum of a galaxy, which is simply its light spread out into a rainbow. Here, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow is the Keck Observatory in Hawaii, it's home to two of the largest optical telescopes in the world. In general, this is a great thing because the bigger the telescope, the more light that is collected and the fainter we can see. The Keck telescopes live atop Mauna Kea on Hawaii's Big Island at over four kilometres above sea level. They are the spherical buildings in this picture. Being at such a high elevation, they don't have to look through too much of the turbulent atmosphere that makes stars twinkle and therefore blurs out long exposure images. Because they're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, the atmosphere that is nearby is relatively stable. And any weather that does occur doesn't go over the peak of the mountain, but around it. So any weather that does occur is very rare indeed. All of this is great for observing. In fact, it's excellent. It's not so great for observers because the air is quite thin. It's difficult to breathe. So when we visit to observe at Keck, we actually observe from the foot of the mountain. The biggest mirror in each of these telescopes is 10 metres across. And it's actually not a single mirror surface, but composed of 36 hexagonal segments. And both telescopes have four different pieces of equipment that you can choose from. These are called instruments and process the light coming from the galaxies in different ways. For my experiment, I chose one called DEMOS, which stands for Deep Imaging Multi-Object Spectrograph. It's actually one of the less contrived astronomical acronyms. It simply means that it can measure the spectrum of many faint galaxies at once. Perfect for this experiment. So I have brought along a mask that I designed for DEMOS to view a particular family of galaxies. It has many slits on it, and when this is placed inside the telescope, each slit lines up with a different galaxy. And here I have a grating, which is similar to the one inside Deimos, and this is like hundreds of tiny prisms all lined up. So how it works is, when this is inside the telescope, the light comes through the slits, then through the grating, you get a spectrum projected onto the CCD, much like what you see behind me. Now, this is quite a smooth-looking spectrum. But if you look closely at the spectrum from a galaxy, you'll see bright spots, which correspond to the presence of different elements in the gas. And you will see dim spots, which show different elements in the stars. I can estimate the total content of metals in the galaxy by measuring the relative strength of these spots. The more nitrogen, the more oxygen, and then the more iron, and therefore the higher total metal content of the galaxy. I can also measure the way in which a galaxy spins by looking at the location of these spots. 
because the motion of a galaxy stretches and compresses its spectrum. So these spots change in position slightly. Now the amount of stretching tells us how fast the galaxy is moving at each, each position and therefore how the galaxy spins. So my research question was this. Just how common are these silver spoon galaxies? To answer it, I used telescopes around the world, like Keck, to observe 53 galaxies that live in families of four or more. Two large mum and dad galaxies and lots of small ones per family. The smallest are some of the smallest yet to have their richness measured. I carefully measured all of these galaxies and used a new accounting method to get a more accurate value for their metal richness. I wanted to compare my galaxies to 100,000 normal galaxies, so I used the same accounting method to calculate the richness for every one of them as well. I found that my large galaxies all line up with the normal galaxies. The bigger the galaxy, the richer she is. And this is great. Our method is self-consistent. On the other hand, I found that my small galaxies have a big range in richness, everything from rags to riches. I discovered that one quarter of them are very rich indeed, and they are potential silver spoon galaxies. But remember that we have to tick off both criteria, metal richness and slow spinning speed. Unfortunately, it turns out to be prohibitively difficult to measure the slow spinning speed of a silver spoon galaxy for at least two reasons. The first is that galaxies are usually brightest at their centre and get progressively fainter as you get towards the outskirts, which is where we want to make this measurement. So the galaxy light runs out and it is often simply too faint to see. Now this goes for normal galaxies as well as silver spoon galaxies and is the main reason that the biggest telescopes are usually best for this sort of work. The second reason that this measurement is difficult is that for silver spoon galaxies, which don't have the protective layer of dark matter, the outskirts of the galaxy can actually be removed if the silver spoon galaxy passes too close to a nearby giant galaxy. So then even if the telescope is sensitive enough, it, there's simply nothing there to measure. I found that at least half of my galaxies could be unmeasurable in this way because they're being cannibalised by their neighbours. But before we throw up our hands at the apparent futility of this, it's important to look at each galaxy individually to see if there are any particularly interesting cases. And I did find one galaxy whose spinning does not match either model. It does have measurable light remaining at its edges, and is at least modestly metal rich. But it is spinning very strangely indeed, like a figure skater with her arms in, spinning quickly in the middle, but whose hands are not moving. This is very strange, and it's not clear what this means. It could be a silver spoon galaxy, but we don't expect them to be stationary at the edges. It could be some sort of strange two-part system where the, the inside of the galaxy is moving at a different uh, rate and a different direction to the outskirts of the galaxy. Or the galaxy could be somehow twisted up and we're just looking at it from the wrong angle. We don't know. So we're actually going to observe this galaxy in three dimensions instead of two. And hopefully this should give us a much better understanding of why this galaxy is rotating so unusually. The telescope we're going to use is the modest-sized 2.3-metre ANU telescope at Signing Spring in Outback, New South Wales. Now, instead of looking at a slice through the galaxy, we'll be able to see the whole face of the galaxy and measure the spectrum through the volume. This should help us to determine whether or not this is a silver spoon galaxy. And even if it's not a silver spoon galaxy, it still has the potential to refine what we know about gravity, which actually is something we don't know all that much about. So today I've shown you a snapshot of how research happens, starting from an incomplete understanding of galaxy formation, where most galaxies start off small and poor of metals and grow to become metal rich, all while spinning rapidly, but where silver spoon galaxies, which are small and metal rich, spin slowly. 
Measuring the light from these galaxies as rainbows is key to determining which are silver spoon galaxies and which are regular galaxies. But this measurement is difficult, even with some of the largest telescopes on Earth. In doing so, though, I did find one galaxy who is particularly interesting and whose spinning does not match either model. So what's the point of all of this? Why do we care? After all, it is easy to think that what's out there does not have much bearing on our everyday lives, at least in an economic, short-term or instant gratification sense. But there are important long-term reasons for doing research for research's sake. Investigating these things satisfies some of our innate curiosity about the universe around us. Over time, we build on our collective knowledge, such as our framework, our understanding of how gravity works, and this sets a platform for future advancement. And then occasionally, new technologies are invented, like Wi-Fi, invented by astronomers at CSIRO. Yes, this sort of research won't tell us everything. To paraphrase Galileo, it won't tell us how to go to heaven, but how the heavens go. And this is still interesting in itself. And this brings us back to the beginning, looking up into the night sky and wondering. It is one of the things I love about astronomy. There's always something more to discover. And the more we know, the more we realise we really don't know that much at all. Thank you.